Hi there, and welcome to Art for All, the Sketchbook School podcast. I'm Danny Gregory. I'm the founder of Sketchbook School. And with every episode of this podcast, I bring in a friend or somebody who I'd like to have as a friend. And we just talk about stuff, creative stuff, art making, the obstacles we face, the opportunities, the joys, our experiences. And we go deep. We don't really have a particular agenda besides exploring each other's brains and experiences. And this week, my uh, guest is going to be Jill Bodonsky. Jill is uh, a lot of things. She is primarily, though, a coach, a coach of creative people. She's also the author of several books. She is um, a prodigious writer. She is also um, a speaker. In fact, she was the speaker at SketchCon, the last uh, Sketchbook School event. You may have seen her there. She was our keynote speaker, in fact. And I'm really looking forward to talking to her. She is funny as all get out. She's smart. She's experienced. And this should be a really fun time. Thanks for joining me. Let's chat with Jill. All right, Jill, this is the second or third take. So let's pretend that, that it's the first take. Okay. Hi. Hi. It's so nice to see you. It's good to see you too. <laughs> So as um so I haven't seen you since I mean you were at SketchCon and you were our our keynote speaker. Do you remember that? It was many years ago. Many engagements since then. Well, it was it actually was one of the highlights of my career. So I do remember Whoa. it. Wow, really? <laughs> it was it was so much fun. Yeah. It was a really fun event. And your in your talk was really great. And um, you know, it's I'm looking forward to you coming back to Sketchbook School, which looks like that's going to happen and actually mm -hmm. on a more regular basis. But let's start by talking about, about, um, you, is, is, would you describe yourself as a coach? Is that, is that the, sort of the primary word that you use? I don't cause I don't have, I actually teach coaching because right. I was blocked by a coach. So I don't have, I'm a creativity coach. I'm more of a creative psychologist and I teach people how to get through blocks and I teach people to teach people how to get through blocks. So I call myself more of a teacher, author, I don't know, creative yeah. renegade, whatever. Jill, Jill of all trades, right? <laughs> yes. Many there trades go. going on. So tell me you were blocked by a coach. I was, I, it was a, a real advantage for me because I got to experience what it's like to procrastinate, to, resist, you know, I've written three books and the first one was really hard to write. So I went to a life coach and she put me on this linear sort of course, which you can't do with a creative person. And she was telling me what to do, which is not advised for a creative person. So she blocked me even more than I was already blocked. And I started going back to her because I had paid for my coaching and telling her what she needed to tell me in order to get me going, which was, you know, Use your intuition. Pick three things that you might want to do during the week, and and you know do the one that's the most fun. So, I wondered how many people are getting blocked by people trying to tell them what to do. It's almost like it's almost like teaching, like talking to somebody about walking or something. You know, if you yes. if you describe walking in too much detail, you'll fall on your face. You don't really, yeah. But yet, obviously, people go to a coach because they feel like there's some something going on, something that's holding them back. Well, I, I have been teaching creativity coaching now for 18 years, but I've taught it based on what didn't work for me, a lot of it, and a lot of it is based on intuition and psychology. That's what my background is. But it's what I teach the coaches is you cannot tell creative people what to do. You need to ask them questions and you can tell them what to do in a question form. Like, what if you broke it down to small steps or you can give questions at a, as a prescription, but, and you can't put people on a linear course. And that's why it's a real intuitive process. It's, we don't go, okay, A, B, C, D, E is what we're going to be doing for this week. We go A, actually just a little part of A, and then like five minutes of A, because that's often what breaks the resistance. And then there's a momentum where there's intuition that takes over versus this, Okay, once you get this done, do this. 
for a lot of creative people, that's not fun. Going, okay, once I get into the process, let me see where it's going and follow it there. That That is often more fun and motivating and inspiring for somebody that is is blocked and wanting to get through. So I call myself a demotivational coach because I'm telling people to lower their expectations and because oftentimes it's expectations that, you know, trying to be like somebody else or these unrealistic expectations or high Perfect, pressure. Perfectionism. Yeah. Perfectionism is one of the biggest. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I've done a bit of coaching myself, although I I haven't really ever been coached. I've had like a, a bit of business coaching and I went to a shrink for a little while, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I've struggled with what, what it even is. And I thought, well, maybe I should go and like get trained and do all that. And I thought, ah, this couldn't be bothered. So, uh, you know, I can coach and, you right now. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I was going to ask you. Like, let's, 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 what, if you, could you make me into a coach or could you tell me like what, what I would need to think about to be a coach? Well, one of the things that the coaches and training do is they get their own coaching. So for instance, do you have, is there something you're working on that you have something that's standing in your way or, you know, bothering you about it? Um, you know, I think my problem is I tend to take on lots and lots and lots of projects mm -hmm. and, um, you know, they are kind of shiny and glittery at various times. And then then another one pops up and then the earlier one is kind of half baked and then there's more and more stuff. And then I start to feel like, Oh, I have so many things I'm not getting anywhere with any of them. And then I lose energy because of that general sense of, um, you know, just having too much on my plate. And then I break down what it is that I have on my plate. And I think, well, it's not really that bad. And then I realize I've put myself back at the beginning of the cycle again. And, um, yeah. So in a, in so, a nutshell. Yeah. And you're not alone. So that I have so many different projects I want to do. I don't know which one to do. And I start on them. And then when I hit a block, I go to another one because at the beginning of projects, there's an infatuation, right? right. You go, oh, like shiny new object. I want to do this. And it's like a relationship. Oh, a new person. I'm going to get out of these habits and become this, this wonderful person. And then all of a sudden the enthusiasm goes away. The, sh the shininess goes away and you're stuck with the creative chaos oftentimes. Like, what was I thinking? Other people are doing this. This is too hard. And then you, oftentimes people start another project because they want that infatuation again. Right. Yeah. It's like, it's like building a house. Like you, you accomplish like a huge amount in like the first week, you know, you dig the foundation, you throw up something and it looks like a house and then it takes months and months to do like the electrics and the painting and all that stuff. And that's, can become really tedious and you just feel like, oh, it was so cool when I went from having an empty lot to having what kind of looks like a house. And that, mm -hmm. that first thing, I mean, I think I find it true to be so many of so many things like exercise, like you can go and exercise or, you know, going on a diet, you can lose like a bunch of weight in the first week and then everything plateaus. It just feels like that is, um, can often be a problem. And new year's resolutions are the same way. So mm -hmm. what, what, this sounds like something that, that happens with you. Has anything worked to, to get yeah, you through it? Yeah. Uh, there's, I mean, there's definitely a lot of strategies that I use when I deal with this. Um, some of them are, I would say the most useful thing <clears throat> is to break things down into, into segments, into doable segments. And then to say to myself, okay, I'm going to do certain bits each day over time. And then uh, I can do simultaneous multiple paths of little bits. So I could be accomplishing a few things on this project, a few things on that project. And then by the end of the week, I can see that I've been making progress across the board and that sense of accomplishment continues to motivate me. So I would say that's a lot of what I do. Okay. So, and you're very accomplished and you do a lot of things. So what I just did is I took you from somebody with a problem to somebody who had a solution and it was your solution. Right. And, and so what, what do I need you for? That's, yeah. <laughs> you need me because you were in the negativity bias at first. I asked you if you had a problem and you said yes. And then it turns mm -hmm. out you didn't. So I switched your consciousness for you. And that's why you needed me. And <laughs> so the other thing we do, because I'm just not into the whole 
okay, let's get your calendar out and see when you're going to do your activity. We do it right during the session. So if you're not getting to something or I don't know where to start, we, I do with, I do a little reality TV show with, um, with different projects. So say you have a bunch of projects. I don't know whether to do this other book or this, this, uh, another sketch con or which I do. So we write all of those down and then we go through and you audition them by seeing which one is giving that little child inside of you the most energy. And that's the one to break down so small, it's hard not to do it. So 30 seconds and that breaks a resistance. And so you're working on that. And just like you said, by the end of the week, you begin to see you have gotten things done and there's momentum building. Uh, so the other thing I would do with you is a, like what's called a credit report. Like let's write down everything you have done Danny, because you're you're focusing on what you haven't done. <clears throat> and as you begin to write down, oh, I got started on this and I did this and I collected this, you begin to see, oh, I am moving along on these projects. And that creates a foundation of wanting to, to do more. It's inspiring and you don't feel like oh, there's so much I'm doing and I'm, you know, there's so much I want to do and I'm not getting to it. So the, the first thing I did with you is I normalized which is a real important part of this process because people think I'm the only one that procrastinates. I'm the only one that's overwhelmed. You know, we go into this myopic place. And when I go, you're not alone. Almost everybody I work with is either procrastinating or overwhelmed or don't know where to start. So that's a sense of relief in and of itself. You're, you're a part of a tribe of people who do these things too. So don't worry about being alone. And that in and of itself can make a huge difference with people. So, and then, then I asked you how you've solved it in the past. And if you said, I don't know, it's never worked in the past, then I would go, what do you think would work? And it's still you coming up with solutions. It, and it sounds weird. Why would I need a coach if I knew what would work? But people come up with, when you ask them that question, you're putting them into the master role versus the victim role. You're going... The subtext is, I know you know an answer. And then if they go, I still don't know, and why would I want to pay money to you anyway if you're asking me these questions? Then I, I give them choices of things I know work for other people, but I don't go, this is what you need to do. Because that I might, initially might go, oh, thank you, you've changed my life. But resentment sets in when we somebody's telling us what to do from this authority point of view. So I give you choices. You could break it down. You could do this. You could do this. Which one of those feels intuitively like you'd like to do it? Is it frustrating then, when you when you are talking to somebody and they're they don't really know where to go with it? Do you ever feel like you need to say, "Look, look, just sit down and do this thing. I'm going to tell you exactly what to do and stop stop your whining and get to work." <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there's sometimes is I, I get over it in there the the head there, but most of the time because I've been doing it for such a long time, I, I do know it works. And I know, you know, well, why don't we try something right now? And, and sometimes resistance will come up. No, I don't want to, I, you know, I don't really want to do that right now. And I know that's the same resistance that comes up during the week. So I go, well, let's, let's um, do it anyway. If you really don't want to do it, you can stop. So let's, let's start. What is something for real, what is something that you've started that you feel like you need to get back to? Me personally? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, I, th I mean, I think a thing I struggle with a lot is doing stuff for me versus doing mm -hmm. stuff that needs to be done. And, um, you know, I mean, I, my job, and I'm sure you can encounter this too, my job is to get other people to do this thing that I myself need to coach myself to, into doing because you oh, know, I can relate. Yeah. Right. Cause, cause, cause I think we all like, we want to make art that's, you know, uh, authentic and that is expressing who we are and that is fun and it's playful and it comes out of our experience and all those kinds of things. But then we also feel like we need to accomplish stuff that other people have expectations about, you know, my publisher is expecting this or how do I find a publisher or blah, blah, blah. So, so I think it's, it's that tension. I mean, so I actually set myself a thing of, which I've done for the last three months, which is I created a project that I don't talk to anybody about. Mm, nobody, my yeah. wife, nobody knows about it and I work on it and it's really, really fun. 
And I have no idea whether it has any purpose and it, it's, and, and it's involving learning really new stuff, stuff that I didn't know how to do before using tools I'd never experienced before. And, um, so I have a great sense of accomplishment from it, but also it has no necessarily practical purpose. I'm developing a skill that may not have anything to do with what I do for a living. So, um, it's kind of a guilty pleasure. And sometimes I wrestle with it and I go, I oh, can't waste time on that thing. Now you've got to go back and do your thing. But, um, general, I find it's been really, it's helped to spur my creativity and my energy in all the things I do have to do as well by having, knowing that I have this sort of thing on the side. Yeah. It's like a fortifier. It, it's like you, ha you have to, it's the whole oxygen mask thing. You've got to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on somebody else. And that's great that you've done that and that you're setting time aside. If you were my client, I would go, let's do that now. Let's, let's spend five minutes if you can, and I will hold the space for you. I'm going to do something too, so that you feel like, you know, since that's really important to you and it feeds you. And I know I, you know, teach my coaches and my clients, you have to do your own creativity for yourself. Um, it's, it's vital. It's like a vitamin. It's like your nutrition and you get resentful and, start snarling at people if, if you're not doing your own creativity, um, if you're a creative person and you obviously are. So how cool is that, that you have chosen something? And I, and I think it's great. You haven't told anybody about it because it's another really told, important thing. Yeah. I've mentioned that, that there's like that cordoned off area over there. Like I've mentioned that, uh -huh. but I haven't said uh -huh. this is what's going on in there. And, uh -huh. and you know, and periodically I'll think like, boys, pretty soon I'll be able to share this with people. And then I'm like, well, yeah, I guess, I mean, I, I will, but I just, mm -hmm. uh, I kind of don't want, I keep pushing it off. And generally, in general, I'm a person who, uh, moves at the speed of, of light. I'm always, I move, everything I do is really quick, throw it, jump, you know, good enough, moving on, let's do some more. Let's and this one, I just decided to set myself a different set of expectations. Keep, I keep going over it and polishing it and making it better and better. And there's somehow knowing that nobody cares has allowed me to do that, has allowed me to, ah. you know, cause it's like, well, and also it's something I'm not, I, I don't do. So, um, if I don't have to do it incredibly well, because it's just like, it's like a dog. If your dog talks and you say, wow, like my dog talks, but it doesn't really matter what the dog says. So I'm kind of like at that thing. It doesn't, I'm a reasonably inarticulate dog is my goal. <laughs> what, what do you think would happen if you told people what, what is, what stops you from sharing what it is? People would say, well, like my wife who, you know, is my, works in my business with me. She, you know, sees everything that I do and I don't want to particularly show it to her because I can imagine I'll have worked on it for several months and then she'll go, that's cute. I know uh, that she'll use that word and I hate that word. So she'll say, it's cute. And I'll think really, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I guess it is, but. So I'll, mm -hmm. see, I'll feel kind of like it's over, you know, sort of like, it's like working on, you know, the big thing. And then you have the big reveal. And I, I remember being in plays in high school and there was always that terrible feeling the day after you did the play. Yes. You know, the letdown. Like total letdown. Mm -hmm. Right. Even though it went really well, mm -hmm. everything was great. It was, you know, even better than I thought, but it's over now. And now it's like, okay, now what, you know, and almost everything you do ends up being mm -hmm. kind of disappointing, not disappointing, but just not, you know, I mean, I, you publish a book, the book is out, great. And it's like, you've just been running toward that finish line. Now you're over the finish line and you're just sort of huffing and puffing and, uh, you know. That, that's really interesting because I'm, you know, I've written three books and and had that feeling of let down. Um, one of them, I just totally got into the process and I'm, I'm, I'm writing another book and I, I'm kind of like you. I, I just, I almost don't care if it, if it goes anywhere, because I'm enjoying the process so much and the process is feeding me. And I, you know, there's the expectation and the, for me, it's, it's, will a publisher want this one now? Right. Um, and I don't, I don't want that to, I want to just write it for myself really first. And I did that with the first book and that was um, really successful um, way to do it because I kept, every time I thought, 
what are people going to think of this? This is goofy and it's silly. I would psych myself out. And as soon as I went, wait, I want to read this. And Absolutely. that's, that's what kept me going. And so I, I think, that, I think that's a great thing for your listeners or your viewers is to maybe have their own secret thing that they don't tell anybody about. And it's, it's something I teach people. Like if they come in and they go, I had this great new idea. And I go, wait, do you really want to share it with me? Because there's the danger of number one, diluting it. And number two, after sharing it, feeling just exactly what you were talking about, like a letdown of, I just revealed it and, you know, now it's over. Yeah. And now it's not a secret anymore. Thing. But I think it's also, I feel like the process has to go on internally as well, that, that um, walled off area. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I've certainly talked and written a lot about this notion that you have a room that you go in to make stuff. And then you have another room that you go in to judge it. And that mm -hmm. you got it when you're in the room that where you're making stuff, you got to keep telling yourself one we'll go, we'll, we'll go over there and assess it and it'll be in the real world eventually. But right now let's just focus on the process. As you say, let's just focus on making as much, you know, and having as much fun doing it and just focus on that part of it. And, you know, the judging is important and we want to refine it and we want to polish it and we want to get feedback, but can't be premature in doing that. And I mean, the danger is, and I know people like this. In fact, I remember my father was like that. My father used to paint like in a, in a bathroom in the house, like he would paint and do all these paintings mm -hmm. and he never showed them to anybody, you know, and he used to write computer software. He wasn't a, but he learned, taught himself to code and he would make, do that. And he was always working on these projects and he would never, never plan to show them. And I know a lot of people like that. They're like, yeah, I'm working on this thing. And they go on and on and on. And then it's sort of, like you might one day see it and go, really? that's what you've been doing all this time. Is that danger? <laughs> right. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. There was that guy who, um, there was a movie in fact made about this guy who, um, his name Joseph Gould, I think. So, mm -hmm. um, is it Joseph Gould? Anyway, so Joseph Mitchell, who wrote for the New Yorker, wrote about this guy who was supposedly writing like the greatest novel ever. And he was sort of like a quasi homeless guy who would wander around the village with this huge like stack of paper under his arm. And for years and years and years, he was writing this incredible novel and it was like 15,000 pages long. It was like, it would just go on and on and on. And then eventually the guy died and, and they saw the manuscript and it was just like, comprehensible nonsense, but he had, you know, he was the guy writing the great novel was his thing for years. Joe Gould's oh, Secret right. was the name of the book. Yeah. Oh, really? I'm going to look that up. <laughs> um, so this has turned into a coaching session with me, which seemed unfair, but um, why do you like doing this? Well, I don't know. I just feel like I'm supposed to do this. And I, mm -hmm. As we started out, I, I do a lot of different things. So I'm not just coaching people or teaching coaching. I'm also, you know, right now the the art has drawn me in. So I'm teaching art. And I just, I love, I you know, I'm teaching again at Omega next year. And, uh, and it just thinking, oh, my God, I have to take all my stuff over there again. And can you talk about what Omega is for people who don't know what it is? Oh, Omega. Yeah, Omega Institute is a place in Reinhardt, Renbeck, New York, where a lot of authors and people do present. It, it, in the 70s, it used to be a hippie commune. It still has that vibe. And you go for a week and take sessions from people. And I, I taught there last July. And it was just really hard to get there because you fly somewhere and then take a train if you're like, us, you have all sorts of materials. So I got invited back and I was like, oh no, do I have to do that? And then somebody on Facebook, I wished her happy birthday. And she said, you know, you changed my life at Omega. And I went, oh, I'm going back again. It's just that feedback. I don't think that you should I, let luggage hold you up. Yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden that didn't become that important that the responses of of lowering expectations and just having fun just seem to work for people. And I love being able to see that. I think, I think I'm a teacher before I'm an artist. Uh, Cause I, I just, well, that's what my, my master's is in. And, and there's a lot of psychology involved. And so I love that aspect. I love seeing what motivates and works for people. And I'm just a creative nut. Um, 
It's like, I can't right. imagine anybody that doesn't love creativity. And I, I always feel like your stuff is so, is so fun and you invent your own language and you invent terms and you do drawings and stuff and you, your books all have kind of unusual forms to them. It feels like you think about every part of it and you try to play with all the bits. It, it has to be playful to me. I have, I have the background of a stand-up comedian. I have one of those difficult childhoods that led to a pretty good sense of humor. So I need to put that sense of humor in my books and they need to be playful and, and I, it, some of it's hard to explain. It's just, I'm sure you have this too. It's like, where did you get that inspiration from? I have no idea. I do know, um, I do have a need for attention. So that's why, you know, I, I put a creative prompt out on Facebook every day and I get the whole dopamine uh, addiction going, oh, let me go see what people said kind of a thing. So that's, and I like having fun with people. I think fun is... I'm a, I haven't grown up. I'm still nine years old. So I bring that to most of my retreats and workshops. But you, and still seem to be a sort of, but you seem to be serious in some ways too, like, or reserved. Is that what it is? Like, I'm an introvert. An uh, introvert. Yeah. Yeah. So I do have, I do have that pensive side to go inside every once in a while. Yeah. I always thought that I was an introvert, but now I've been told that I'm not, that I'm an, that I'm an extrovert. I think you can be a little bit of both too. Well, you know Do you get say. more, yeah, you get more energized by being with people or by being alone? I think, I don't know, both. I, I don't, yeah. I mean, cause they say that if you're an extrovert, you get, you get energized. If you're an introvert, you get depleted when you're around other people. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I'm consistently either, but I, I definitely like talking to people and hearing their, points of view and stories. And I find that talking to people helps me to come, helps me to understand myself and my brain too, my ideas. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely energizing that way. That's why I like doing this podcast, yeah. honestly. Yeah. Particularly after COVID of sitting around <clears throat> in the house for a couple of years, it's nice to at least have deeper conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. I like, I like, when I did your keynote speech for SketchCon, that was a high for me. But afterwards, I was like, <laughs> so um, I like both too, for sure. But yeah. I feel like I need a lot of solitude for what I do. The yeah, I remember ideas. the first time I taught a workshop was in a place called Rowe, which is in Massachusetts. I don't know if you've ever been to that place, but mm -mm. You should, if you ever get a chance to go there, you should. It's pretty cool. It's like for, it was like a kid. A, children's camp in the twenties, I think. Um, and then it's sort of some sort of socialist commune, but they ended up buying this little town and they own like the church and the fire engine and firehouse and all the stuff, but it's really, really nice. So, so I did my first ever workshop, which was 10 years ago. And, um, I couldn't, I lost my voice. I couldn't talk for a week afterwards. It was the most exhausting thing I've ever done. It was just three days. And I thought mm. I may not be cut out for this because Either that or you need to like really get into shape in some way to deal with just the intensity. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you have mm -hmm. that too. I do. I do. I have to go hide in my room after I do workshops, but I, I do one every, every year, every February in Taos and it is, it's five days long, but wow. it also has some downtime where people can just do what they want and or do their art. So how, how yeah. programmatic are you when you do a workshop? Like I, like I remember the first time I did one and, and I think in general, I've dialed back on this, but uh, I remember I had to teach a class at the open center in New York and it was they were like, can you teach this class? And it was like every Wednesday for two or three hours. I was like, yeah, sure. That sounds like fun. And then I thought like, how am I going to do this week after week t talking about stuff that honestly I didn't even feel like I knew anything about it. And then I would over prepare or would, I'd have like, now let me do a two hour slide presentation. I just, it took me a long time to kind of figure out like how much, because I think it's important not to just lecture people. You want them to do mm -hmm. stuff. And that took me years to figure that out. Um, but it was always felt like I could control the situation if I just talked a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And I was, and I would always worry that if I let them start to work on things, they would be thinking, 
like that's what this workshop is. Like I could be doing this at home. I don't know. <laughs> well, there's a lot of anxiety yeah. that came, came, came up around it. So. I know. I, I've been doing this 12 years in Taos and I always over prepare. And I, I finally got to the place where this is actually going to work out because it has for 10 years. And I, I don't use half the stuff I prepare, but I'm glad I have it because I change it according to what's going on with people and what people seem to need. Um, but I still get anxious every time I do a workshop or retreat and I have just gone, this is, this is what happens. And this is the imposter syndrome comes in and I go, well, thank you very much for sharing. I'm going to do this anyway. And then barrel through it. And at the end of the retreat, just feel really rewarded by how it turns out to. I think it is, yeah. it is, it is a great feeling to, to know that you created memories for people and gave them tools to do stuff that can, can continue to work for them. Inter it's it, imposter syndrome is interesting. I was thinking about this idea of like, what if you really were an imposter? Like, <laughs> I think like, a lot of people you... are. Yeah, I guess so. I, I, I always thought I, I always sort of envy sociopaths. Like imagine like you could just do this thing and not give a damn what anybody thinks. I'm far too self-conscious well, and worried about that. But uh, imagine if you really were pretending that you were an expert in this, actually pretending to be it. It's almost impossible to imagine. But I, I think a lot of people do. And I, when I'm teaching the marketing part of this coaching, I, I say some people have talent and they don't have confidence. And some people have confidence and they don't have talent. Which do you think are going to be the most successful? Um, so if you have talent, work on your confidence and and you have to do it by asking questions what would it feel like to to be more confident to to really believe in myself rather than expect yourself to do it all of a sudden but with with confidence and i believe this is what has helped me get through is uh, you know i went in to be a theater major i just act as if i have confidence i act as if i am i put myself in the role okay you are the workshop leader that knows what she's doing. And mm -hmm. what would that person the, do? Yeah. What would she do? Because there's another part of me that's like, I just want to be at home reading and it acting as if you have confidence is a lot like having confidence. So it, it seems to, to work. <laughs> and what yeah. about talent? What do you think about talent? Do you think, do you think first of all that it exists? Yes, I definitely think it exists. I think people inherently have talent, but I also think that people can get it. And, and I think when it's, it's one of the things that, that psychs people out thinking that they're supposed to have it right at the beginning, especially in art. One of the things I start my workshops with is let's talk about delusional thinking. You know, you, a lot of people quit immediately because oh, I can't do this. I can't even draw a stick figure. And it's like, of course you can. You haven't done it yet. So your delusional thinking comes in when you think things are supposed to look good right off the bat. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. And that's when I tell people, okay, you got to close your eyes and draw because then everybody's on the same um, field and people actually like what they draw when they have their eyes closed and they, they begin to see that your voice comes out with your eyes closed. You know, I, I ask everybody to draw a bicycle with a basket that has flowers in it. And everybody's like, oh, I can't do this. And they open their eyes and they're like, oh my gosh, I really love, I oh, just did one. See, <laughs> here, um, <laughs> it's like, oh, I love this one. And everyone's is different. Everybody's bicycle looks different. It's not the same bicycle because with your eyes closed, you're not trying to be like somebody else. You're doing what's in your memory and your voice begins to already start to come out. Um, Maybe you have a really that, talented that, hand. Yeah. <laughs> right, Just whatever. this one hand is talented. That's, that's yeah. it. Stops at the wrist. <laughs> but that whole expectation of uh, I need to be good right off the bat really gets people. Um, and, you know, I tell them, be bad. Be bad at first. Everybody here, be bad. Do something bad. Um, and that just frees, frees people up. Uh, yeah, I was doing a workshop last week and I said, do a bad drawing. And, and if you do a good one, you failed. So please 
make sure you do a bad one. And then I would come mm -hmm. around and say, that's way too good. Like you're really, yeah, that's terrible. I do that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why do you think it is that we have this unrealistic expectation around creative things specifically? Like I think about, you know, I talk about other things that people learn to do, like driving. Like nobody's born a driver. You need to learn how to use a car and then you need to practice it until it becomes second nature. Nobody's born knowing how to cook. You know, you need to go through steps. You need to learn these skills. Nobody has those expectations around a lot of the things that we do and that we see other people maybe even being really good at, you know, and there's mm -hmm. also things that we're willing to be mediocre at. Like we're willing to, I don't know, play tennis or, you know, do yoga, do something like that without expecting like I'm going to become a professional tennis player or I'm going to be able to do every yoga position perfectly. We understand that we have these limitations. We'll do our best. We'll still enjoy the process. And it, but somehow with, with art, I think with visual art more than any other form, um, you know, I mean, people say I'm not a writer, but you still do write stuff. You still write an email, but when it comes to drawing and art making, there is this set of expectations. that's so insane. Um, mm -hmm. it is insane. Why, yeah. Why do you, what do you think that's about? Oh, it, it comes from fear. It comes from fear of being judged. It, creativity is a really vulnerable experience. It's people, they're inventing things. They don't know whether it's good when you're, when you're baking bread, you know, it came out well, cause it tastes good when you're, you're doing something. You know, so many people draw things like Picasso in my, my workshops, but they go, this is crap. But Picasso didn't think his stuff was crap. If it was a Picasso, it, how would you feel about it? It goes back to that. Yeah, yeah. And I I put up like these pictures of horses. I go, okay, imagine in your your head, if you did a pasture of horses, what would it look like? And then I, I put up in the PowerPoint like 20 different examples of how people interpreted horses. And one of them looks like a real child's drawing. It's like, look at this one this child did. Um, and it's just kind of a, a line that looks like a horse with stripes. And then I said, this is a Kandinsky. That's what I was going to say. It sounds so, like that famous Kandinsky. Yeah. It's a Kandinsky. And I said, a lot of people do something like this in my workshops and they think this is crap. This is just scrawls. This, and it goes back again to that confidence. I believe right. in my work. And it's, it's like one of my favorite quotes is George O'Keefe said, I've, already settled it for myself. So praise and criticism go down the same drain and I am quite free. And it's, it's people who, who get into the process and understand practice is what you need to do in order to get better that succeed. And it's the person with that unrealistic expectation. And, and I think that's uh, like so prominent in our culture, especially now when you can see so much of what other people are doing. And people like, I'll do something. And then I'll get on Instagram and go, oh, that wasn't as good as I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we compare ourselves and comparison is toxic. So I teach a lot about how, first of all, to normalize it. It's completely normal to, to do that. And then to neutralize it. And part of neutralizing it is normalizing it. It's like, I'm human. I compare myself. Okay, I'm going to do this anyway. And continue, you know, I think one of the best things we can do for artists is teach perseverance because it really, it does happen. You get your voice, you begin to see what you enjoy, and then you're dedicated to it. You, you're, you're hooked. I and think, I think that, but I think the struggle is if I say to myself, I can never do this, but I'll try, I can never do this, or I have no talent, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then it's hard you, because it is hard. The process is hard. It's hard. Mm -hmm. Learning is hard. You know, you have to keep working at it. For, but if you don't believe that you can actually win, it's like, it's like being in a game that you are told you will definitely lose. Do you still want to play? You will say, mm -hmm. I don't have the energy for it. I'm not interested in it. So I think that's the, the, the real struggle is how do I know that if I put this in, this time and effort in, that it will lead to something or am I somehow handicapped in such a way that it's pointless? Even though, even yeah. Though I think, yeah. I, when, when people are like that, 
um, for one thing, I think everybody can get better at it. Uh, you know, I think the initial things are what you need to say, okay, I'm, I'm not good at this and put yet on the end of it. Um, mm. cause that changes the whole dynamic of it, but there's so many fringe benefits. And so I teach, you know, you're not just going to get a drawing. You're, you're going to get resourcefulness and flexibility and perseverance and courage. And those things not only apply to art, they begin to spill over in other areas of your life. So if do it for the courage, do it for the, the self-respect of staying with something. And then if something comes out of it, great, do it for the enjoyment of the process. And especially I get a lot of people in my workshops that are 50 and older and they've been, they've been accomplished at something and good at it. So going back to being a beginner is really uncomfortable. And I think putting that right out there, you know, I say it, you guys have been really good at something, whether it's being a mother or being an accountant or a scientist, and now you're a beginner again and you need I hand out little bracelets. I handed them out at SketchCon. They're tolerance muscles. You need to be able to tolerate that you're going to, your first stuff is going to look crappy. Can you tolerate mm. that? Because that tolerance is also going to serve you with patience for other people, tolerating other people, tolerating what's going on in the world. You're developing tolerance, not just for your mess ups with art, but or other parts of your life, but you have to tolerate rejection. You're not going to get as many likes as you thought you were going to like if you put it on social media. You're get, you need to tolerate. You have something in your head and you can't get it on the page. Can you? Can you tolerate those? That's one of the first skills you need when you start this whole art thing, and it's worth it. And I think we have to convince people. I don't need to convince you how worth it it is, because you can do this for the rest of your life, and you have a place. You know, my book, one of my next books is, is called I Make Mark Art So I Don't Die of Reality. <laughs> and it's, it's from that Nietzsche quote where he's got a quote very much like it. And we need to do things because we enjoy them. And the truth may not be that they'll be great, but if you're enjoying it, that's, that's going to be enough. And you can have this world that you create for the rest of your life where you can go, Okay, it's inflation and politics is really sucking, but I'm going to draw a bicycle with my eyes closed and be an entire different world of my own and then put a watercolor wash over it, frame it, and people are thinking, going to think I'm a freaking genius. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I like that a lot. Yeah, mm. I mean, I think I think it's talking about when people have been accomplished in something and they're doing something that they're not good at. That there's also something potentially freeing in that because you are allowed to be bad at it, and you know you you know you may have spent your whole career trying to get better and better and better at it, and you don't you know you have so much invested in being successful at it that if somebody said, "Well, that's not very good," it would be calamitous. But if you if you're not very good at you know juggling, mm -hmm. who cares? <laughs> you know, but it's also mm -hmm. fun to. To not be good at it, and going back to what we were saying earlier, your trajectory could be really amazing. Like you could become an, a pretty good juggler in a week, you know, and then you'd have mm -hmm. this new thing that you, and you'd have that sense of pride and accomplishment. And you think about things like people running marathons, people who will never win the marathon, may not even complete it. And it's a lot of work and, you know, you're doing it basically for yourself. It's going to be miserable and hard, but it's going to be interesting and you're going to learn about yourself and then maybe next year you'll do a bit better at it. Um, I, I think it's the process of being in the marathon is mm -hmm. the fun is the whole point, right? It's not about finishing the marathon and seeing where you were on the list. You're not doing all that work just for that. You're doing it because of whatever you're feeling and thinking while you're doing it. And, you know, I think to be able to say to people that experience that you had when you were six and you were sitting at the kitchen table drawing that feeling why mm -hmm. you were doing it then is a great thing to get back to. And if you could live your life like that, then you're kind of like your cat sitting on the windowsill, just looking out the window and just being present, right? As opposed to uh, constantly yeah. trying to deliver results. I love that. Yeah. One of, one of my favorite stories is I, I used to go do watercolor painting outside with this guy I had a crush on. And I just basically did it with him because I had a crush on him. And <laughs> 
And so I was, and I didn't think anything I did was good. And he was not a perfectionist and he would take everything he did, which I didn't like. And he would frame it with black electrical tape and, and glass <laughs> and hang it in cafes. And I would just cringe. And he had really poor boundaries. Um, <laughs> so he would take mine without telling me. Oh, and nice. he, he took one with, that wasn't even finished. He framed it with glass and black electrical tape. And I walked into a cafe one time and saw this blunderous thing on the wall <laughs> and somebody bought it for $350. Wow. And I realized I'm not even my own audience, which a lot of people aren't. I walk around these workshops and see amazing stuff that is childlike and loose and they're going, this isn't any good. And I'm like, I love that. And I have to convince them I'm not just saying that because I'm the teacher. They do amazing things that they're not their own audience. So Exactly. I, I always say you're a better artist than you are a critic to people like that. You know, like you can't, oh, you can't recognize great. what's good about what you did. Um, yeah. And I'm better at it than, than you are. So my opinion counts more. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Um, what is the most common thing that people struggle with? Do you think? Showing up, showing up for their, the most common thing that people come to my coaching was, I really want to do this and I'm not doing it. Um, and it's because of expectations, procrastinations, perception of not having enough time. Mm. And, you know, cause we, we do, we'll make time for TV. We'll make time for other things, but because of the fear that art brings up, people think they're not, they don't have enough time, but they're, they're kind of rationalizing that. So, and it's one of the things I do the best with, because like I said, I go, okay, let's do it now. Um, for five minutes, what it, what has it been? So you that literally you have somebody doing? like typing while they're sitting with you or drawing while yeah. they're sitting there. Mm. Typing, drawing, writing, um, emailing somebody they need to email. I go, okay, I'll, I'll wait. I even go, I'll get off the phone while you make that phone call and then call me back because, you know, holding the space for somebody, the quality of the time that they're spending is also really different. They feel grounded. We're tribal you know, we're pack animals. So it feels better when somebody's holding the space and it feels more valid. It's like, okay, you haven't, you haven't been doing your drawing. Do you have a piece of paper? Um, I want you to really lower your expectations and I'll give you five minutes to do it. And they can't believe how much they get done in five minutes too. It's like, I didn't realize, you know, I thought he needed to have an hour every single day this week. Um, and it's like, no, set it for, for 30 seconds or five minutes. And then if, if you build a momentum, keep going with it. And that's, that's how I work out. You know, you talked about exercise and the way I exercise, my first step is find my shoes and I, go, I, and I have a success experience <laughs> and they go, okay. Get credit for that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now get in the car, drive just to the parking lot at the YMCA. I, I did that too. So just breaking things down ridiculously, just, and then you're in this moment, oh, I'm here. I might as well work out for five minutes. Oh, it's 20 minutes. Wow. I deserve an ice cream. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, yeah, that's interesting. But, I mean, I find people also, they think they have to have all this stuff before they can do it. So it's like, I need to take yeah. some time. I need to go sign up for a workshop. I need to go buy the art supplies. I need to set up a room in my house. I need it's to It's another avoidance I strategy. Yeah. It's another avoidance strategy. The thing I teach is ready, fire, aim, <laughs> which it sounds like you do too. It's like, I, I'm just, you know. I'm in fact working on a video on that very idea right now, ready, fire, aim. So yeah. Yeah. yeah just make a bunch of stuff and then figure mm -hmm. it out. Yeah. Yeah. Make it with what you have in the space that you have it in the time that you have it. And, and then that, that creates the desire to do more, I think. Yeah. I mean, you think about these like great, uh, outsider artists. I'm not sure. I think they're not called outsider artists anymore, but, um, you know, people who are not trained, who are, do not exist inside the art sphere. Right. And then they all make like amazing things out of like, you know, ice cream cartons and lollipop sticks and twigs mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And you think, mm -hmm. you know, that's like, what is it that makes that good? It's not the materials. Uh, a lot of times it's, as you say, the confidence. And I think that's, that's what's again, so appealing about children's drawings. It's the mm. confidence that kids just seem to know what they're doing. 
They don't ask mm -hmm. anybody's opinion. Nobody taught them how to do this. They're just like, yep, that's, and then so often you look at a kid's drawing and go, what, what is this? And they can tell you the whole story about what it is. You know, that's Batman mm -hmm. and that's an ice cream and that's a tree. And, you know, and you go, they know their whole thing. Like they know it. And can't I just blunder ahead with that confidence? You know, um, and I think so often you'll see art, you know, you like you think about musicians and musicians who take someone like Bob Dylan, you know, and you think, well, mm -hmm. Bob Dylan just didn't have the kind of voice that you would think he would be a professional singer. Um, but his confidence was carried him through in a lot of situations. And, and I think that that's true of so many artists. It's true of actors. It's true of a lot of creative people. We just like, because we're all insecure. I think being around somebody who says like, this is the way it is. You say, mm -hmm. well, good. I'm glad someone knows what's going on. Yeah. You just go into a modern art museum and there's a spring with half a cat picture framed with some, ketchup thrown at it. And one person will go, just, I got to throw this away. And this person said, this is edgy. It'll change people's lives. And then it, it does. And you, you look at it, you know, it's just all so subjective. So that belief and that confidence. And, and that's why I walk around like with one of those mats and put them over people's pictures because it instantly right. turns mm -hmm. it from this to scratch to this framed picture and it looks right. much different and they can see that. That's a yeah. good point. Cause it's, cause you can go into a gallery and see stuff like that. And you can think you can have various responses. Like I'm an idiot is one response. Like, I don't get it. What is this? Yeah. Another is this is a con. This is crap. You know, they're just, mm -hmm. it's a hustle, but the way to get something out of it is to say like, well, what could this be? And how could I feel about it? And so I, yeah. so you, your confidence allows me to move to a new place and to go somewhere different. And that's a really a great oh, experience. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. What was the artist seeing here? There must be something I can see too. Yeah. It's like, it's yeah. like going, it's like when you go to a restaurant and you're trying some food you've never had before and you go, well, people like this, they eat it and they, it's in a restaurant, you know, and they're, they're confident about like, well, you can eat these crickets with, you know, <laughs> exactly chocolate fudge on them. It's like, well, why would that be? And I think as creative people in particular, um, we have to be open-minded about just about everything. Right. I mean, we just have to, mm -hmm. you have to always be saying, not necessarily let me figure that out, but that's okay. Like that, that's a thing. Like that can be a thing, you know, or how and can I think, see this differently? Yeah. How can I see this differently? So we have right. to ask ourselves that all the time. Yeah. I think there's something I, when people are really reactionary about art, you know, and you think like, well, it's a Campbell soup can, like, you know, he's just mm -hmm. a con man. And you think, well, or, you know, that's a bunch of splatter on a canvas. Like, why is that art? That's the history of art. The history of art is people doing that, other people mm -hmm. being idiots about it, eventually that becoming <laughs> normalized. And then we go on to the next mm -hmm. thing. And if you look at our culture like that, that's what we as artists do is we introduce you to uncomfortable new experiences. And our first reaction to them is that kind of monkey brain thing that says, this is crap. This is wrong. This is not for me. Um, and then eventually you realize like, no, by getting on board with it, I'm actually going to be transported to some new cool place. I should. Yeah. That's what it's for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when we do that, then we're able to tolerate other people better. We're, we're practicing tolerance and acceptance, and then, not just and empathy. that, but empathy. an empathy. Yeah, yeah. Understanding. Yeah. I think that's a key part of being an artist is being empathetic with others and also sympathetic with yourself, right? Allowing yourself mm -hmm. to, to do the things you do, to have the feelings you have, to deal with the experiences that, you, that make you who you are and accept yourself. I think if you're yeah. constantly struggling with yourself, it's it really, it's, it's going to get in the way of your art. It's, it's all about self-talk. It's about, I can do this versus I can't do this. And I'll try this versus uh, it'll never work. And, you know, those are just, we just become better people for ourselves as we are open-minded towards our art. Yeah. yeah. I mean, art is really cool. I think it's like, we, we it think is. of it as a luxury. We think it's like, mm. well, you know, when, when we've done everything else, then we can have art, but exposing yourself to art is, is the opportunity to understand and to think about the world differently. It's like, the, it's the height of being a human being. It's not a luxury. It's an, it's an essential thing that we can yeah, all do. I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. 
Well, maybe we should stop there. I don't know if I'm ready to be a professional creative coach, but I learned a lot from you today. And, um, <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. Um, and, and also, I, I want to say again, I'm so glad that you're going to be part of Sketchbook School because I feel like the things that you talk about are the things that, that I want us to be doing. Like, that's what I... Mm -hmm. And I've, I've wrestled with this since the beginning because I've always felt, talking about imposter syndrome, I've always felt like I can't really teach people how to draw. That's, I, I, can't, I can't really take you through those lessons, but I want to mm -hmm. create an environment where you can basically teach yourself to draw. And I feel like mm -hmm. that's a lot of your point of view too, which is like an enabling as opposed to um, sort of uh, prescriptive. Kind yeah, of just, just uh, selling the contagion of art so that... that people get it and want to do it on their own and, and see how freeing it is for the rest of your life. Yeah. And overcome the fear. It. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm so happy that I get to, to teach for sketchbook school too. So looking really, forward really to really that. Cool. Well, that was fun. I really enjoyed talking to Jill. She is uh, just, I think a lot of the topics that we covered were relevant to me and hopefully they were relevant to you too. Uh, all the things that we struggle with as creative people and how to find resources and ideas to help solve them. So that was really great. Um, I wanted to tell you that this is probably going to be the end of this season of Art for All. So we've been, this is the fourth season we've done. I think this is the 15th conversation that I've had as part of this series. And I'm going to take a little bit of a break because I have a bunch of other projects I want to work on. And I will be back at some point with the next season. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed these conversations. If you've missed any episodes, feel free to go back through the archives. There's um, a lot of great conversations we've had here. And there's three previous seasons with other kinds of ideas that you might find stimulating. So thanks very much for joining me. Uh, until we meet again, I'm Danny Gregory, and this is Art for All. Bye-bye. <laughs>